In 1776, the framers of New Jersey's first constitution created a government based on diffused power. The legislature would prevail over the governor, ensuring that no one leader would ever be as powerful as a royal governor or a king. In 1844, a second constitution modestly improved the office of the governor, but those who held the post remained powerless to change the way things worked statewide. For years, this legacy of diffused authority and limited executive power shaped New Jersey's politics and its identity. But in 1947, reformers dramatically reversed course. A new state constitution transformed one of the weakest governors in America into one of the strongest. The 1947 Constitution was held up in one of our constitutional law classes as a model which made the New Jersey governor, if not the, one of the most powerful governors. New Jersey's governor is absolutely one of the most, if not the most powerful governor of all 50 governors in the United States. If there are any other states, they're equal, they don't surpass it. When you put it all together, the New Jersey governorship is the best job in the country because it's the most powerful. I could do things that no other governor could do. New Jersey has the strongest governor in the nation structurally. The problem is in how you exercise that power, but it's there if you want it. Since 1947, the office of the governor has been a bold experiment in executive power, and governing New Jersey has been its challenge. Major funding provided by New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group. Additional funding provided by PSEG, Verizon, Education and Health Centers of America Incorporated, Harris, New Jersey Resources, New Jersey Restaurant Association, and Public Strategies Impact. This program examines the power of the office of New Jersey Governor with some of those who have occupied the coveted post and with those who've studied their use of the powers from inside and outside the State House. This is a story of how one remarkable change in a state's political history created a new kind of governor in America. An office with greater authority, greater responsibility, and with power that's still evolving. The people who wrote the New Jersey Constitution were very suspicious of strong authority from an executive because they were fighting the King of England at that time. So the Constitution of 1776 gave the governor only a one-year term, and the governor was not elected by the people. The governor was elected by the legislature. He was really a creature of the legislature. That was about the weakest governorship you can imagine. For over 100 years in New Jersey, from the 1844 Constitution to the 1947 Constitution, we probably had arguably one of the weakest governors in the country. You served a three-year term. You couldn't run for re-election. The legislature had almost all the appointments that you could possibly make. The governor made almost none. It was like a figurehead. A uh, governor could only serve one term. Uh, he could serve another one, but it could not be consecutive. So right from the start, the governor was a lame duck. They had three years to get it done. If you could outlast the three years because you disagreed with the governor, you were still there, the governor was gone. You almost wonder why somebody became the governor of New Jersey. I think because it, it, was, it had some stature and it, and, and it didn't have much responsibility. No one constitutional power makes the 1947 governor distinctly powerful. It's the combination of powers that the framers bestowed on the office that sets the governor in Trenton apart. First, the framers gave the governor a chance to serve two consecutive four-year terms, just like the U.S. president. Next, they made the governor the only office elected by all the people of the state. The governor is the only statewide elected official sitting in Trenton. Now, a couple years ago, New Jersey passed a, an amendment to the Constitution, so we have a lieutenant governor elected as well. But even that person runs on a ticket. They don't run independently. 
So there's no competitors on a statewide basis. No attorney general, no treasurer, no insurance commissioner, or things of that sort. People who are elected in other states. So that focal point is on the governor. Being the single elected executive official in New Jersey vests the governor with virtually exclusive authority uh, 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 and authenticity to speak for the people. He's the only one elected by them, the only one whom they can hold directly accountable. In most states, roughly about two-thirds of them, you have uh, potential political rivals for the governor. That doesn't happen in New Jersey. There's one person who is elected by everybody from Cape May to Mawa. There's one person who can therefore command the attention of everybody statewide. That's the governor. Until we elected a lieutenant governor, there was no important power in the state which wasn't appointed by one person, the governor of New Jersey. I don't know of any other states where that's true. The New Jersey governor has broad appointive powers. This person gets to appoint all the judges. Other states elect judges. Not here in New Jersey, they all get picked by the governor. Every cabinet officer, every judge, literally thousands of members to boards and commissions. Being able to appoint judges and appoint commissioners and um, all the other people you can appoint in New Jersey was always looked on with great envy by most of the other uh, governors. Other governors would just shake their heads and say, you get to appoint all those people? Boy, I wish I had that power. When you say, yeah, all the prosecutors, all the judiciary, except for one level that the uh, chief justice gets to appoint, uh, they just were amazed at it. When the governor comes into office, the first thing that happens is someone on the staff walks in with a, about 19 cardboard cartons full of resumes from county chairmen and freeholders and mayors all over New Jersey looking for appointments for their people or whatever. It gives them enormous political clout. That's a tremendous power. And, and you don't know, the public has no idea the number of boards and commissions. There are hundreds and hundreds of them. The boards of trustees for universities the people who oversee different regulated professions, the pharmacists, other kinds of doctors, these people are all appointed by the governor. And each group cares very much who the governor is and who that governor appoints. People always want to play nice with the governor on some level because you need something from the governor, whether it's your own appointment or appointment for another person that you're trying to support. He's in a position to make all these appointments you know, award all these patronage jobs that are the bread and butter of politics. And a governor who does that well generally gets legislators who just will not go against the governor on anything. Frankly, it's part of the political process. You pay people off. Um, presumably, you're making sure that they're good and they're right for that position, but they're people who've been your supporters. Anybody tells you differently is blowing smoke. I mean, that's just not, and that happens in, in every state, and governors do that. But New Jersey, you have many more to appoint, so it gives you more leverage. Millions of dollars, billions of dollars get spent by state government. Somebody has to decide to whom it goes to. Those decisions are made by the governor, by the governor's office, by people appointed by the governor. All of these kinds of powers stem from the governor. One of the primary reasons that the 1947 Constitution was adopted was to centralize management control under the governor to clean up this sort of messy bureaucratic structure where you had agencies doing their own thing. Prior to the 47 Constitution, the legislature had created a lot of separate agencies and departments that might be subject to the governor, but in a lot of cases weren't. Woodrow Wilson himself, he complained that, you know, every little puddle or pond in New Jersey seems to have its own commission. So authority was diffused in New Jersey, and uh, that makes it difficult for a governor, uh, no matter how dynamic he is. And even sometimes when he appoints his own people, sometimes they buck uh, the wishes of the, of the governor's office. Sometimes they become captives of the agencies you've appointed them to. I could veto the minutes, which means I could stop any action, which means they could do nothing without the approval of the governor. The ability on the part of the governor to go and veto the minutes 
allows him to have a continuing influence in the way that the um, organization operates. That's the power the governor has that 49 other governors wish they had. When I started to prepare this budget, I had certain goals in mind. This blue Some of the 1947 powers most relished by governors give them the advantage in dealing with the legislature on the budget. Last year, I promised the taxpayers that this budget would be different. And it the Constitution says that the governor should submit the budget, which really is the most important public policy action every year. You present the budget. It is your budget. Uh, some states it's not. Some states the lieutenant governor puts it together and some states that's the legislature that has the initiative on the budget process, not the governor. When you begin the process, you say, here's how much money we expect to have for the coming fiscal year. And in New Jersey, that number is the sole possession of the governor. And this is my plan. Thank you very much. The real secret power the governor has is the governor gets to certify the revenues. So at the end of the day, the governor can make up out of whole cloth or can talk to economists, talk to the treasurer, and say, I believe the revenues of the state of New Jersey will be, for the sake of the story, $30 billion and not a penny more. At the beginning, yes, he estimates revenues. At the end, he takes any spending item out of the budget that he wishes and the budget stands, it doesn't have to go back to the legislature. The veto gives the governor another advantage, and the line item veto, particularly on appropriations item, gives the governor an advantage. If the governor needs a particular legislator, the governor will say, well, you know, I won't item veto your piece in the budget, but I expect you to help me. If it's the law in the state of New Jersey to fund something, but a budget bill passes that denies funding to that something, the budget bill supersedes whatever the law dictated prior to that. Budgets are more than just numbers. They are the balance sheet of our principles. It is almost a unilateral power. I think other governors, much like the President of the United States, would kill for a line item veto. Veto powers extend the governor's advantage into other areas of the legislative process as well. New Jersey is one of the few states in which the governor has a conditional veto. The governor can send back past bills asking the legislature, saying, well, I don't really agree with the bill as you passed it, and I'd like these changes. Many times the bill is three quarters good. And then some, some legislator or some special interest will have stuck something in there, which is a special interest. It's something for the few people, not the average person. And you, you, you've got a right, as governor of New Jersey, to simply take that out. So if there are no objections in the room, uh, all right, I'll sign. And the governor can rewrite whatever he or she wants, give the bill back to the legislature and say, here's how it ought to be with one simple vote on the floor today, you can make this law, and you know, 99 times out of 100, the conditional veto is concurred with, and the governor's wishes are, are, are held true. It was a period of time, at least, while I was governor. Right? New Jersey was the only governor that had that ability, and almost every governor said, I really, that's incredible. The ability to take a bill, and as long as you stay within the parameters of the intent of the bill, to rewrite it was a power that other governors just would have given their right arm for. And then the legislature has to have an extraordinary majority to override your conditional veto. The New Jersey legislature's got to have a two-thirds majority to override. And that is very difficult to pull off. And in some states, it's rarely pulled off. And it's not pulled off often in New Jersey. That is something that makes the governor very, very powerful, particularly when exercising the conditional veto. Now, the President of the United States can't conditionally veto things. The governor of New Jersey can. These constitutional powers have often helped governors gain the advantage over the legislature, a significant break with New Jersey's past. But New Jersey's unique political landscape can also give the governor an edge in the balance of power between the two branches. 
One of the ways in which governors are powerful has to do with whether a legislature is powerful or not. The New Jersey legislature is the only legislature I know in the nation where there is no sustained legislative session. In most states, the legislature comes to the state capitol for a concentrated period of time, for a period of weeks or a period of months, every year, every other year, and they're there just about every day for that period. New Jersey, because of the size of the state, you can go home every night. It's a commuter legislature. It comes in the morning to Trenton and goes home at night, sometimes late night. I don't think you have the time on task that you have in other places, and I think that gives the governor an advantage in New Jersey. Keep in mind, the, the citizen legislature that we have is made up of teachers, lawyers, doctors, businessmen and women. It's very frustrating to be in the legislature, to balance out demands that are put on a part-time legislature versus a governor who does nothing but this job seven days a week, 365 days a year. Now, in every state, the governor is still the most powerful person, but some of the legislative leaders have a higher profile. Some of the individual legislators have more of a presence because they're there. Most state legislators in New Jersey don't even have offices in the state house. Most days, the governor pretty much has Trenton to himself. There's not a lot of competition. Governors throughout the nation are more powerful, generally speaking, than legislatures because the governor is one and the legislature is many. It's the governor's power to set the agenda because the governor knows what the agenda will be and doesn't have to struggle to get there. The legislature does. That gives the governor the advantage of kind of putting it out there. The legislature has to change it. I mean, it's the same on a football field. If you've got the ball, you're more likely to score uh, than if you don't have the ball. Things, particularly large things, uh, systemic initiatives, really have to come out of the governor's office. And the appropriate role for the legislature is sort of to take what is offered and then modify it as best they can, sort of chew around the edges, so to speak. There's an aphorism in New Jersey politics that the equation to get anything done is 41 plus 21 plus 1. 41 is the majority in the state assembly, 21 is the majority needed in the state senate, and the one is the governor. The governor is part of every equation. But you can't get anything done without the governor. Four years ago, I came to Trenton to announce my candidacy for governor in this very room, wearing this suit. <laughs> the governor can have more of a connection with the people of New Jersey because the governor is a person, whereas the legislature is an institution. It's an abstraction to people. It, it, it isn't real. Uh, it, it can be demonized and it can be applauded, but it can't be connected with as a flesh and blood person like a governor can be. The governor also, being one rather than being two or many, the governor has the ability to get the attention of the media, and that's what's called the bully pulpit. The Assembly Speaker and the Senate President, the two other most powerful state officials, are elected by a handful of people within a district that has a total population of 220,000. The governor is elected by the entire state. The state has over 8 million people. So it's not even that these two people are using the same size megaphone when they talk. There is a bully pulpit that the governor has, and everybody else has a soapbox. New Jersey's media landscape has long been overshadowed by the markets of New York and Philadelphia. Trying to establish a statewide identity through the traditional media was very, very difficult. You had to do it through TV. New Jersey does not have a commercial TV station, so that made it tough when there was some major issue that the governor wanted to address. 
uh, we used to have to do it twice. We'd have to go someplace in North Jersey for the New York media and someplace in South Jersey for the Philadelphia media. And someone once joked, this is why God invented Cherry Hill in Newark. Steve, we're in the assembly chamber. The assembly has adjourned for the night. This was the second house. To New Jersey is a totally different today. media environment from other states. We basically had NJN and not much else. And as a result, we were one state in which the governor almost never appeared on network news. And that really had a, a strange effect because I guess every governor was really going through intermediaries to the people. You have traditionally have had to deal with the Star Ledger. Now things are getting much more diverse, but the Ledger's the dominant paper in the state with no major TV stations. So, you know, we were three times, traditionally have been about three times as big as the next largest paper in the state. And that was their method of getting out. We don't have a statewide newspaper that covers the whole state. We don't have media that uh, is, is watched by huge numbers of people. And that's made a huge difference in our politics. And um, given the governor increased powers that the Constitution probably never intended. Governors became the sole beneficiaries of what little media coverage there was. The governor is the one and only person in New Jersey who people recognize. They have no idea who the president of the Senate is. He thinks they do, but they don't. Or the Speaker of the Assembly, and they never have. I ran for governor having been attorney general for three and a half years on the front page of the Star Ledger probably two or three times a week. When I did my first poll, I had a four, one, two, three, four percent public recognition factor. More people knew then who was the mayor of New York than who was the governor of New Jersey. I was Speaker of the Assembly, I was majority leader, I was minority leader. Then I decided to run for governor. I thought the whole state knew who I was because of all the things I'd done in the legislature. I took a poll 15%. <laughs> the other 85 had no idea who I was. <laughs> they all knew who the governor was. The governor of New Jersey is the big cheese in this state because of the peculiar geography and media landscape of the state. If a governor is compelling from a media standpoint, that governor gets double the coverage of the governor of any other state. That governor gets covered by the New York media, which is really the media center of the nation, and by the Philadelphia media, which last time I looked was still the fourth largest media market in the country. That person gets amplified throughout North and South and Central Jersey twofold. It means you can get people to support your agenda because you have the bigger microphone. You have the ability to talk to everyone. Nobody else in state government has that ability. And so it's very hard to compete when you have someone who's using it effectively. We want to cut taxes to create jobs and rejuvenate the economy. 10% each year for most people. Christy Less. Whitman ran for governor promising a 30% cut in state income taxes. Oh, I thank the, those who supported me for their support. By inauguration day, she sensed growing resistance in the legislature to the plan. All that it can be. Do you really think you're going to be able to bring down taxes? Absolutely. I wouldn't keep saying it if I didn't think I could do it. That proposal enabled her to win the election. That was the pivot for the entire election. And still, nobody knew whether she would actually carry through on the promise. There were a number of uh, legislators, including members of our own party, uh, who were not uh, particularly enamored of that idea. There were a lot of people thought, you know, who's this newcomer, Whitman, she was only a freeholder, we'll, we'll educate her. There was a very condescending attitude among legislative leaders towards her. I could hear the start, well, you know, campaign and, and we've got pressures and we're going to have to take a second look. So I figured the only way I could really get it started was to announce and present them with a bill at my inaugural. And I didn't tell them about it ahead of time. And she surprised everyone by calling for an immediate income tax cut, not 10 percent next July, as she had called for, but 5 percent now, retroactive to the 1st of January. Let's not keep economic growth waiting another minute. If President Clinton and his Congress can reach backward into time and raise your taxes retroactively, your governor and your legislature can cut them retroactively.
There was nothing they could do. I mean, you know, I said this in a speech to a room full of people who obviously they wanted to hear that because they wanted to see there were going to be tax cuts. That's what I'd run on. I knew it would be January 1st. Uh. <laughs> it took everybody at the State House by surprise. It took the legislature sitting there in front of her by surprise. I just didn't have the year straight. Uh. Republicans controlled the legislature, but those who resisted this idea, what are you going to do? Come out and say, wait a minute, I'm against tax cuts, uh, and I'm against my governor, and I'm going to pick a fight on this when I have judges and prosecutors I want to be appointed. To use the venue that she used, her inaugural speech, uh, to drive that message was very effective. Made her a Republican star the first year of her governorship. At her press conference, Whitman said she was not trying to tell lawmakers who's the boss. No, I'm just telling them what, I, what it is that I want to do and that I'm consistent with what I want to do. The legislature will tell you the governor is a pain in the neck because they control everything and they don't ever talk to them. And I, I, it amuses me to see different governors running into the same, same thing. It's a natural tension. Controlling the bully pulpit can be a source of tension between the governor and the legislature. But that control can be lost or won over time and tip the balance of power. We talk about these powers of the governor, but again, you operate within a larger political context and that allows you to do certain things or not do certain things. Florio called the bill one of the toughest weapons bans in the nation. The governor has run into more legislative opposition to the assault weapons ban than any other bill he has proposed. Jim Florio used the power of the bully pulpit early in his term to introduce legislation, which quickly made political enemies. One of the first things that Governor Florio did when he took office was to win a ban on assault weapons. It was a big part of the campaign platform when he ran for office in 1989, and it was part of keeping a promise to the, to the public. There's a very powerful gun lobby in the nation, as well as in New Jersey, and that, um, that lobby, that interest group, felt very strongly against our ability to go ban the possession and sale of these military assault weapons. You know, he had to fight for it. Sportsmen, hunters, individual rights type people didn't like it. It wasn't something the public was clamoring for. It was something that he singled out as some, something that would be good public policy and good politics, and he, it turned out to be good politics for sure. Jim Florio announced that we had a significant budget deficit that had to be dealt with. He anticipated, correctly so, a state Supreme Court decision that was going to require the state to put much more money into urban schools. And so he raised $2.8 billion in taxes. Now I, I know what the headlines are going to say tomorrow. Florio signs biggest tax increase. I can't write the headlines. He also had to do this in the middle of a recession in the early 1990s. The tax hike push was an executive victory over a reluctant legislature, but the political fallout cost Florio the bully pulpit. You had a huge pushback by legislators, a huge pushback by the general public. Extending the sales tax to paper goods resulted in people picking up rolls of toilet paper and throwing them at Jim Florio to show how much they hated that idea. A lot of the anti-tax revolt was actually organized and funded by the anti-gun people. So all the argument was about Florio's raising your taxes because they knew that was the most potent weapon against him. They knew if they said Florio's a creep because he banned assault weapons, that wouldn't fly in New Jersey. One of the big problems of being the governor of New Jersey, where you've got all this media attention, is it can turn on you and it can get you. He was a victim of, of the powers, I, I, I suppose, in, in that case. In the next election, both houses of the legislature were taken by Republicans with a veto-proof majority. When Republicans took control of the legislature, the assembly voted to overturn the assault weapon ban. And so after that, Governor Florio really just took a very public campaign to the people. The state Senate today has failed to override Governor Jim Florio's veto of the bill that would have substantially weakened the ban on semi-assault weapons. By virtue of creating a campaign, so to speak, to get people engaged with their legislators, 
we had an overwhelming victory for this whole proposition that New Jersey didn't need more access to these weapons. Florio was clearly pleased with today's vote. Republicans in the Senate were happy to put the issue behind them. You can be the strongest governor in the country constitutionally, but if the legislature is of the other party or chooses not to go along with you, not as much gets done as when the governor can more fully use the powers that the Constitution grants. The governor has responsibility. That's the negative side. The governor can't hide, or it's very difficult for governors to hide, and it's much easier for legislatives to hide. It's the House's fault. It's the Senate's fault. Growing up in, in Brooklyn. The governor you know, can't pull any of that stuff. My, my uncle, Uncle Tom, Tom Florio, got me one of my first jobs shoveling up after the horses in a stable in Prospect Park in Brooklyn. I never imagined it would be a good apprenticeship for this job of being governor. <laughs> Governors have responsibility and they feel responsible. And that's another reason why they're out there trying to get policy through. They really think it's their job. They want to do it. The court has always felt that the Constitution and the Constitutional Fathers intended a very strong executive, and that therefore many powers that aren't even enumerated in the Constitution are implied to make that a strong governor. The executive order authority is just enormous, almost limitless. The governor can issue an executive order which carries with it, as pointed out in the Constitution, the weight of law. He can sit behind his desk and sign a piece of paper and essentially make a law on his own. Executive orders have been the tools of choice for governors to change policy by making law almost instantly and letting the judiciary define what's implied by the Constitution. The Pinelands of southern New Jersey had been recognized as a fragile ecosystem and a significant water supply. Brendan Byrne personally pushed to see regional land conservation become state law through a Pinelands Protection Act. But any possible legislative support wilted against a variety of interests united against land use policies imposed from Trenton. Byrne had few options to curtail development, and so a bold but risky executive order seemed like the only move left. And so I said, okay. And I issued an executive order has, uh, you know, stopping building in the Pinelands. He, over my doubts, by the way, expressed to him privately, um, implemented an executive order which was incredibly far-reaching in its scope. He asserted land use controls over about a third of the state with no legislative authority. In an executive order, Governor Byrne officially imposed a building moratorium on the Pine Lands. And even that essentially stopped all building, line. and he but said at the end of the executive order, this executive order will stay in effect until the legislature enacts a statute which substantially accomplishes the goals of this executive order. He sat down and signed a piece of paper that took something like a million and a half acres of New Jersey and said, you can't put anything here. Developers are almost certain to challenge Burns' executive order, and his idea of a permanent Pinelands moratorium faces strong opposition in the legislature. And people were stunned. Some were appalled. And not only that he did it, but that he was able to do it and get away with it. After he signed the order today, Burns said he knows developers will suffer, but he said their children will benefit. A summary hearing on the constitutional challenge to Byrne's order signaled that the Supreme Court would likely support the governor, and legislators quickly began backpedaling. They went back to the legislature and said, oh my God, the Supreme Court may approve that executive order. We better pass the legislation before they do. They acted very quickly to pass the legislation. The governor signed it. The legislature enacted uh, the Finance Protection Act. That controversial ban on building in the Pinelands is now law. Governor Byrne signed the measure today in a ceremony that reflected none of the bitter debate over the bill 
as part of the ceremony, a passage from John McPhee's book on the Pinelands was read, a passage that predicts the Pine Barrens would ultimately be paved over. I told John at that time that I was going to prove him wrong. We did. I'm going to prove him wrong. That has been commented on time and time again as the most extensive use of an executive order in history, in New Jersey and anywhere else. And it was. I thought his use of executive power and the creation of the Pinelands was very, very important for the state. Maybe a little stretch because uh, whether or not he could use an executive order in that way the way he did it's questionable. You know what, I respect people who disagree with the use of an executive order to impose land use controls on a good chunk of the state. On balance though, I think it got us a bill that did have constitutional validity. Um, without the exercise of executive power would not have happened. And, and Brendan Byrne did save the Pinelands. If the governor wants to get something done, he can pretty much get it done. Now, assuming it's uh, an honest effort and assuming it's uh, within reason. And the Pinelands is a good example of that. Another area that the governor really, I think, gets singular attention is when you have an emergency. Everyone sort of looks to the executive for leadership. Considering the combination of conditions created during the weekend storm. You can tell businesses, you gotta close. You can tell the New Jersey Turnpike, no more cars until <laughs> this emergency is over. You can do whatever you want to do. You, can, you have really dictatorial powers over people for the state of that emergency. And I don't think anybody's ever fully defined what an emergency is and how far those powers could be stretched. Tom Kane also sought to preserve land through a statewide policy. While New Jersey was in the midst of a development boom, his proposed bill to protect undeveloped wetlands immediately encountered resistance in Trenton. The governor said too much of the wetlands had been lost to the bulldozer since he first spotlighted the issue four years ago. For whatever reason, well-organized interests and groups seem to be able to paralyze the legislative process. The builders and the lawyers attached are very, very powerful people. And I got it through one house and then they just blocked it in the other house. I couldn't get it through, and because of this boom the state was having, we were losing wetlands every day. He knew that he was not going to be able to get this out of the legislature, and that the executive order was, was really the only way to go. So I did something, well, almost legislative violence. <laughs> what I did is say, I've got emergency powers when there is an emergency. And I said, this is an emergency. And there's going to be no more building in the state until we have a regulation for building in the wetlands. And I stopped all building. <laughs> you can imagine. On protection of the wetlands, the governor took the bold step of issuing an executive order. The governor himself called the action dramatic. Even some supporters labeled it drastic. But the wetlands are close to Kane's heart, so close that he jumped the gun on the legislature to block wetlands development for the next year and a half. It was sort of like one of those all-in kind of things. We're going to push all our chips into the middle of the table and we're going to do this. And, you know, and we'll see what the legislature does in response, if anything. The builders immediately went to the Supreme Court and asked for an injunction, which I knew they would. And I didn't know whether I'd gone too far or not. I really didn't, because that's really stretching the powers. And the court refused to give an injunction. They said, we'll take it to trial. But the builders couldn't wait. Time is money for a builder. And they came into my office and said, you win. How fast can we get the bill through? The bill was in my desk in two days. Uh, and I signed it. has put his stamp of approval on the measure and promises to remove his controversial moratorium on new development once he signs the bill. Under the legislation, development... But that was a case of using, maybe even stretching the emergency powers. It's important and it's necessary when the state's in real trouble, but some governor could someday abuse it because it is so powerful. And we gotta keep an eye on that. 
the governor exercises power and even in some case when exceed that of the legislature. So it's an enormously powerful position. The framers of the Constitution in 47 realized with that citizen legislature, I think they called it at the time, there would be a need for a very strong executive branch leader. And they deliberately uh, framed, it, framed it that way. The legislature sued me twice because I was changing the budget. And they said, that's clearly not constitutional. And it went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, not only can he do this, but he can also do this and this and this. So they not only affirmed what I had done, but they gave me additional powers that were not specified. So the Speaker of the Assembly who sued me, Ellen Karcher, said we're never going to sue him again. <laughs> he, said, he said, you've made this governor more powerful than ever. The post-1947 governor was a revolutionary break from a system that traditionally held executive power in check. Has it gone too far in creating a powerful governor? The new constitution may have added power to the office, but along with that power comes responsibility and accountability. 1947 was an attempt to bring not only authority, but the light of day into the State House. You often hear the adage that uh, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. My experience in New Jersey suggests that diffused power is corrupting. Corruption exists because power is diffused at lower levels of government. One of the big problems of the 1844 Constitution was that it really limited the power of the governor and maximized the power of the political bosses who controlled the vote. Political bosses go way back in New Jersey. It's certainly a state that was for a long time run by people who weren't elected by the public, weren't known by name to the public, but were clearly the powers behind the throne. A lot of times they're really more concerned about appointing people within their county, appointing their own judges, making sure that they a prosecutor, for example, is friendly uh, to them and winks at to potential misdeeds. You have to remember that for years, New Jersey was governed by leaders who liked it in the shadows. You could make money in the shadows. They didn't want the light of day to shine on them. They kind of had a tacit agreement with the public. You leave us alone and we'll leave you alone. Reform movements to strengthen the governor against the power of political bosses had been routinely defeated since the progressive era of Wilson. It goes back to being in the shadows and being governed by leaders who wanted to be in the shadows, who ran the state for a while just on the money they got from taxing railroads, and then the railroads pretty much ran the states. The politicians were totally beholden to the railroads. Then if you look at the late 19th century, the trust these giant corporations, they incorporated here, they were shielded from prosecution, and in exchange, New Jersey exacted a lot of tax money from them that made it unnecessary to raise taxes here in New Jersey. This kind of culture developed in New Jersey that we, the people, don't really have to pay for things. The railroads will pay for them, these corporations from out of state will pay for them, and state government won't really do much anyway. The special interests early in this part of the century, or the last century, the railroad interests, the power interests, all were more significant for New Jersey than the governmental system was. The political party's county chairman in the 21 counties really ran New Jersey. The strengthening of the governor was, I think, an, an effort to undercut their power, undercut the power of the political parties, and run a much more effective government. Corruption at the highest levels of government, uh, runaway and diffused power on the part of local governments and the paramount power of political bosses all led to the 47th Constitution. A new wave of reformers led by Governor Alfred Driscoll pointed to the state's failure to curb corruption or enact statewide initiatives as good reasons for rewriting the Constitution. A key vehicle of statewide change would be the governor. The state had been failing in a number of ways, and people knew it, so there was appetite for change. But they did it right after the Second World War. Now, that was in the atmosphere of Franklin Roosevelt. Franklin Roosevelt was thought at that point 
to have saved the country through strong executive power. The executive branch was dominant, seen as the one that could effect change most easily. So the extension of that to New Jersey's constitution in the form of the governor was a logical progression of what was happening in the country. New Jersey copied it and therefore created a very powerful chief executive. The atmosphere was right. And that's why New Jersey got a constitution. And my own feeling is uh, a better constitution than any other state has. Certainly the Constitution of 1947 made a major difference. It made it, I think, easier to get things done in New Jersey. But did it end problems? No, of course not. There are always political problems. There are political county chairs in some counties, in some parties, who still have a great deal of power, who learn to band together to make that power bigger. There are these regional power centers that are constantly frustrating the governors and forcing them to make deals with them. They can block what the governor wants to do if they choose. If there's ever a time in New Jersey when these unelected people don't have any power at all, we haven't come to that place yet. Did the Constitution go far enough? Other states may have weaker governors, but more coherent statewide governance. The framers of 1947 redesigned government, but they didn't redesign New Jersey. One of the things that limits the power of a governor is the tradition in New Jersey of fragmentation. There are 566 municipalities in New Jersey. That comes out to 0.075 per square miles. We have more municipalities per square mile than any other state. These municipalities have enormous power, and they guard that with great jealousy. In other states, uh, more authority is uh, statewide or countywide. It is a dramatic impact on our politics. Home rule is ingrained in the political culture. Towns want to be able to run their affairs, no matter how small they are. It's an inherent restriction on the governor's ability to run government efficiently when there are local instrumentalities that have their own power. While home rule does put certain limitations on what a governor can accomplish, He's still far more powerful than any individual mayor. He can force a point of view on a mayor and try to get around home rule. It's a minor impediment to getting done what he or she wants to get done. Home rule enables you to have another big dividing line between rich and poor. It's a system based on financing your activities, your schools, your police protection through local property taxes. We have so many layers of government that it's really extraordinary and we don't need them all. And they cost money. And when you're responsible for the budget and people look to you for taxes, they often forget things like property tax are, the state doesn't collect it, the state doesn't spend it. That happens at the local level, yet the governor is the one who gets blamed when property taxes go up. You can reduce income taxes, sales taxes, even corporate business taxes, but the tax that everybody feels, that everyone really thinks about, is the property tax. And governors are simply unable to dramatically impact that. Every governor loves to say, we have 566 municipalities, and unless we consolidate them, we can't do anything about it. But a governor could do something about it. The income tax was implemented for property tax relief and it's entirely dedicated to property tax relief and it is distributed by the governor. The governor writes the budget and says who gets how much property tax relief. You know, a lot of people in New Jersey say, well, if I can make sure I've figured out how to educate the kids in the four square mile town where I live, my job is done. I don't care about the next town. And so New Jersey has a lot to do to overcome that sort of balkanization, that feeling that we're not really one state. That's a governor's responsibility, but all the constitutional tools in the world don't help that to happen. Home rule is a grand tradition in this state. Uh, it's vexed politicians and good government types for as long as I've been covering the state, but it's held dear in localities and neighborhoods, and it seems like it's gonna be a fault line in New Jersey for a good long time. In every state, the governor has statewide responsibilities. 
and each legislator has district responsibilities. I think in New Jersey, it's magnified by the localism of New Jersey. It's been much more difficult, I think, for New Jerseyans to identify as New Jerseyans rather than North Jersey, South Jersey, this and that. So the governor really is not only the only statewide official taking statewide responsibility, but the only official with a sort of a statewide head on his or her shoulders. We are a state, as Benjamin Franklin put it, like a keg tapped at both ends because of Philadelphia and New York. And um, we've got to fight always for our own identity. You know, I lived a while in Texas, and people down there are just crazy about Texas, make Texas, you know, number one. And you don't find that in New Jersey. You have Philadelphia sports fans and New York sports fans, and it's uh, just a different place culturally. The governor of New Jersey can't really tap a New Jersey patriotism like a governor of New York or Texas could. Really, you've got two New Jerseys. You've got one of these pockets of cities, and then you've got these suburbs that have totally different interests. What's good for one is bad for the other, and governors have really had a tough time with that. Inevitably, like almost everything else in the state, it washes up at the governor's door, and he's sort of asked to be the referee or the arbiter here. Uh, you know, when a governor's sworn in, you ought to give him one of those black and white striped shirts and a whistle, because he spends half his life refereeing fights between people. I'm not convinced from seeing them operate that we've had a more coherent state government driven by a governor who can basically get what he or she wants. I see it as more of a free-for-all just like every other state. I'm not blaming the Constitution for that. There are these other forces like the political machines and the home rule, the sort of divided nature of the state, whether it's north, south, or rich, poor. There are those other obstacles that maybe they help explain why our government has been so ineffective. If New Jersey's constitution makes the governor powerful, it also can make you lonely. Because what it really means is, if you want something done, you look around and say, well, who else cares about this? And you might find out that nobody does. I would trade half the powers for a few friends who can help me get something done in the legislature or in the media or a populace that has a little greater understanding and desire to solve problems at the state level. A governor is not powerful. The position of governor can be powerful if the person sitting in that seat uses that power effectively. I regard governors powerful, successful, achieving, but I regard them as caretakers. They take care of the state. They can't be expected to make changes that will endure for eternity because things always change and they can't be expected to solve all the problems. I don't diminish the office by calling them caretakers. I think uh, we need taken care of. Governors since 1947 have enjoyed the most power they've ever had. And with that, they've taken on a greater responsibility to be effective leaders. Leaders capable of building consensus, resolving challenges, and enacting and implementing reforms while dealing with two other equal branches of government in a state without a tradition of strong statewide authority. You are a thoughtful and a generous people. You cherish our liberty, you enrich our prosperity, and I am deeply proud to serve you as governor. Thank you. I think in 1947, when they rewrote the Constitution, they were being very clear about wanting there to be a center of power. We should, in fact, keep and honor the constitutional changes that were made to make our governor strong because it gives us a place to look. Where does the buck stop? And it clearly stops with the governor of New Jersey. So, governor his... In times such as these, which are you know, very rapidly complex changing times, when you need transformational change, it has to come from the governor. And if it doesn't come, then you have a void. The governor is the leader, and that's the possibility and the problem. When you've got a state where the governor is so powerful, and so much more powerful than anybody else, you've got to have good governors. You've got to have a governor who will make use of those powers, who will unite the state, and do things to move the state forward. If you have a weak governor, or a governor who can't do those things, then the state's really going to suffer. That's the bad part of a governor, having a system like this.
I again announce that I'm a candidate for re-election as governor. The powers are what you make of them. If you want to get something done, you got the power to do it. That's New Jersey. To learn more about the power of the governor, go to njn.net, where you can find additional interviews exploring the history, politics, and stories of governing in New Jersey. The Power of the Governor is available on DVD for $24.95. To order, call us at 877-656-8433 or visit njnstore.org. Major funding provided by New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group. Additional funding provided by PSEG, Verizon, Education and Health Centers of America Incorporated, Harris, New Jersey Resources, New Jersey Restaurant Association, and Public Strategies Impact.